Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series that's being hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in association with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. And today, uh, our guest is Heather Raffel. Mm -hmm. Hi, Heather. Great to be here. So uh, I'm ha so happy that Heather is here today. Uh, she is an award-winning Iraqi-American playwright and actress living in New York, uh, but she was born in Detroit or Michigan. In, in Lansing, in Lansing. Um, Lansing, Michigan, yes. So um, we're very happy to have her here. Uh, Heather has written um, several plays and acted in them, and but recently she has a book that's been published. Um, it's called Iraq, Iraqi Plays, The Things That Can't Be Said. So um, Heather, yes. you know, tell us a little bit about your experience first before we get into your work, because your father is a Chaldean mm -hmm. and uh, your mother is full-fledged American. <laughs> And my mom's from Battle Creek and my dad's from Mosul. From Mosul, yes. And um, I recently read something that was very touching, an article that was published by American Theater called A Country in Between, Remembering My Iraqi American Father. It was such a touching article and I recommend anybody that's watching this to just to check it out. Um, and it's brief, it's a very easy read, but in that short, um, Article is just so touching the relationship between you and your father and the influence that it has had in your work. Right. So, tell us a little bit about growing up as an Iraqi American. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll say that there's it's kind of, I would put that into two categories. There was the growing up as an Iraqi American before the first Gulf War, and then there was the after the first Gulf War, right? And the before the first Gulf War, I was I was a kid. I was a blonde kid in Michigan and not in Dearborn and not in Detroit. I mean, growing up like in a suburb of East Lansing. And um, so we, my dad had good friends from Iraq that were my ammos here, but we didn't have an extended family here. So in a way, I feel like I had a very American lifestyle but with huge connections to my roots and how my dad loved his family and spoke about them and the foods we ate and the things that we liked. We went, um, my only trip to Iraq at that point was when I was four and a few of my aunts and uncles had come to visit, but it was also during the Iran-Iraq war when people couldn't travel freely, right? And then I was at University of Michigan, I think it was my sophomore or junior year when the Iraq war happened. And then that changed, that changed my perspective on everything. And it felt like it tore me in two. So I would say that that began my theatrical um, pursuit of how to tell the stories of Iraqi people on American stages. And when I wrote Nine Parts of Desire, there hadn't been an Iraqi female protagonist ever on an American stage. So it really, you know, to to have gone from the kind of upbringing I had to a, a pretty much singular focus in my theatrical work was really defined by watching how my dad hurt during that war and worrying about family and feeling like I needed to be a bridge between the two cultures. And so are you saying that the war kind of instigated that sense of responsibility to kind of bring those voices forward through your writing and through your artwork? I, I, absolutely it did. Absolutely it did because there were so many misunderstandings that I became aware of. I mean, I might've become aware of them anyway, but I was, I was a kid growing into it. I mean, a university is when you're coming alive intellectually anyway, right? So it was about that time that I was probably going to discover them, but I mean, it was, I think for all of us, there's a loss of innocence when we experience our first war, right? I mean, it it shouldn't be an easy experience for anyone, but when you're an American with Iraqi roots, it's like, how did, how did this happen? I wasn't Italian American. I wasn't, right? Like I was Iraqi American at the one point the two nations had ever been at war. So yes the responsibility was huge to to speak out 
Yeah, I often, I feel too that um, it was during the wars were like kind of a say, sense of waking you up to something deeper to yeah. what you're doing. And, um, you know, so I just always loved writing, but then it became a sense of responsibility about writing certain types of stories that I had never thought of before. Um, you say in the article, uh, you'll write, I miss my dad. He was my root system, my connection to Iraq, and my connection to the questions that drive me. He was the person I wanted most to understand, yet dad was never one for conversation. And um, that reminded me so much of my mom because I loved uh, storytelling and hearing stories. And my mom was just always shutting them down and just wanting to put the past behind her. And I interviewed last weekend, interestingly, when I was reading this, I interviewed two filmmakers last weekend, um, one of Jewish background who has been doing documentaries about the uh, Iraqi Jewish community, which has unfortunately dwindled to four people today in, yeah, in, in Iraq. Iraq yeah um and so in the documentary one of the things that her mother uh emphasized is don't talk about anything that happened all the atrocities just don't talk about it just move forward just don't look back and I was wondering um giving your background and you know given that you you were born here and you have more of a western perspective um what do you think this like, what is the root to that kind of feeling of just kind of leaving everything and not sharing it? Because this still exists in a lot of um, minorities that are in Iraq. And have you noticed it only in the minorities of that region? Or is this just kind of maybe uh, an, an Arab cultural way of just kind of not talking about the things that we view, we see and uh, the atrocities that we experience? I would definitely say it is not minority specific. Um, I would also say that because my experience I knew was centered in America, I did I did a lot of due diligence to speak to every Iraqi that would speak to me, right? I mean, my, my feeling was that what I was born with as an Iraqi American made me curious, but it didn't make me knowledgeable. And so I had to go seek out the authentic knowledge from people who had lived it. And across the board, um, I would say that the, the traumas are carried very personally. And there are people that want to talk about that and want to share stories and realize that that's both a healthy way through it, but also the way we can hopefully understand and maybe even change history. But I would say that the majority of people don't want to talk about it, I think less for reliving, less about being afraid of having to relive it in talking about it, and more because the stakes of what it takes to move on are big. What it costs to survive here or anywhere requires a lot of attention. <laughs> so there really isn't much space to open up to the past. What I think is different, though, is the way they many in our culture want their kids to continue to hold the culture. Right. So what is passed on to the children, even if some things aren't talked about, a lot of things are talked about and that it's it's I find a lot in that generation, a sense of being torn between wanting to pursue the life of the individual that America provides without too much responsibility to culture mm -hmm. and yet not wanting to walk away from culture and wanting to hold it and carry it forth. Yes, that's a very good point. And this is very, very true that this is where uh, people are right now with that. Um, you mentioned that your uh, dad passed away on March 19, 2020. And that is the 18th year anniversary of the start of the Iraq war. Um, so, and then you talk about, you, you've shared your feelings about the war, what, what that felt for you. But then you talk about how um, his passing less led and to, to and the influence of creation the Iraq plays, the things that can't be said. Can you share that a little bit, the story behind how this book was created? So this book what, is, what's it about? 
Yes, this book is an anthology of three plays. Um, so they were plays that were written and produced in different time periods of my life. One is Nine Parts of Desire, which I started writing in 1998 and re started reworking um, when the second Iraq War started in 2003, and it opened in 2004 and has been playing on and off ever since. The second in it is the opera Fallujah that was um, premiered in 2016 and that I began writing in 2011. And then the third is Nora, which um, premiered in 2018 and had productions all the way through 2020. So they, they, you know, nine parts of desire is about nine different Iraqi women through both wars. Fallujah is very much in a, um, is a returning veteran and an Iraqi boy um, during the battles of Fallujah. And then Noura is an immigrant family, you know, that's dealing with ISIS overtaking Mosul. They're a Christian family that is living here, but is watching their religion and culture and, you know, feel, feeling um, that they no longer are Iraqi and they have to, they're immigrants to America. So that one takes place in New York. So each one is its own kind of spotlight into a different time. However, they all feel like conversations with my dad because they're all pulling upon things that we, that I would either try and wanna talk about with him that he wouldn't wanna talk about that I felt he was moving through or going through. And so when it came time, when I was asked to make an anthology of this work, it happened to be in the year that my dad was passing away and he was passing away of Alzheimer's. And as we know from that disease, it's, it's about the things you can't hold on to, right? And I thought there's so many things my dad never said that were too personal to talk about, too dangerous to talk about. Right. And that this anthology really was a collection of all those kinds of things that that are too tender. Um, so I dedicated it to him and that's that's why that title and it's why they live as three plays together. Hmm. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I was when you were mentioning um, Nora, I watched a reading of that play at the Arab American Museum. And I really loved the humor and the honesty in it. It was really beautifully done. Um, and I have not seen Fallujah. And you said that's an opera? Mm -hmm. It has. Yeah. And um, I, I would be interested, and I will be reading the book because I'm interested to, to know more about that. And I know everybody knows about Nine Parts of Desire was an international success. It played everywhere, including uh, um, many times here in Michigan with different mm -hmm. actors. But you also acted in that as well, did you not? I did. And Nora, and all of them, right? Not in the opera because I'm not an opera singer. Oh, not in the opera. <laughs> oh, no. But I did, I did perform, <laughs> yeah, I did perform in Nine Parts of Desire. Um, yeah all through its New York run and then in LA and DC and other places. And then I also performed in Noura in Washington, DC, New York and Abu Dhabi. So you recently had a workshop that I attended um, through the Arab American Museum. And um, I really enjoyed it by the way. And it kind of, I, I wanna share this because it seems like I'm wondering if you're going to be doing similar type of work. You talked about trauma and you talked about your father's experience and what he wasn't comfortable expressing. And, and the, this workshop was for women and um, to share some of their, um, you know, experiences as Arab Americans and uh, what their issues are and what they look forward to. And I, it was like very active journaling type of workshop. And I was wondering, um, what led to that workshop and are you planning to do more similar types of events because I found it very helpful and I find that what you're discussing right now and uh, even the stories of understanding like how important it is for us to express ourselves which I, I, I do think it's a cultural thing and that we're most of Arab Americans um, you know there are a lot 
that do want to express their experiences, but sometimes they don't find uh, the venue to do so. So I feel like this is providing that. So what is what led to creating that workshop and are you planning to have more in the future? Um, yes, we are planning to have more in the future. So um, what led to that particular workshop is that the beautiful actress and writer Denmo Ibrahim is developing a, um, a Middle Eastern centered female voiced version of Chekhov's Three Sisters and is being supported by the Arab American Museum that also supported me when I was writing Noura. So when any artist or writer comes into the museum to gain support from the museum, part of that is outreach back to community. And she wanted to lead a writing workshop in community and I had led one in the past. So they just asked if I would join and offer some you know, best practices of things that had worked. So a lot of what Denmo and I spoke about was what were the themes in the play that she's working on and wanting to write and how, what would it be like to explore those themes in community, which is also how Nora was written. And I think that, um, I think that, if, you know, we could go on and on and on about that as a process, as a way of working for a writer. But I think the most important thing that she and I and many artists in this community realize is, yes, we're doing the work. Yes, we're trying to bring um, a relevant Middle Eastern voice both to the Middle Eastern community and to American communities across the nation. But what we realize is there is a need to discuss and unearth and be inside these issues with our with our fellow people in our community, whether they're writers or not, whether they're artists or not. And even if they are artists already with their own practice, there is so much camaraderie and care and joy in gathering together and doing a workshop. So it's um, the point of doing it is to feed each other, mm -hmm. to support each other in, in that whatever is discovered as private as that may be, that if there's a route to any of that, then becoming public and then becoming stories we see on stages and film and novels and poetry, it's just it's just a birthing process so i think that yes there will be more of that but the all the the real reason why is because we know the need is out there both for the stories to be made but also to just navigate this within even if the stories never are made public you see what i mean yeah i mean it was really wonderful it was just recent and it felt so comfortable and such a um like space uh, safe forum that we were able to share so much and everybody had their uh, opportunity and the space to share and express how they feel um and i often say um you know i i often feel like we're like the minorities of the minorities of the minorities yes. <laughs> you know so yes. we're yeah. a minority but it's just like we're kind of lost in the shuffle and so sometimes there is no place to express and um for instance during the workshop i was able to express some very um just very a lot of feelings that i only write about in my books and it felt really different from writing them in the book and almost like an um, secrecy type of you don't know where they're going in the universe to a group of women that I really felt like they were listening and that they could, you know, uh, just appreciate what I'm saying and just listen, regardless of what they're, you know, they were thinking. So I really appreciate that you're putting that effort for the community, the Arab American community, because it is, like you said, much needed. And I look forward to more similar workshops. Um, and I would like to know uh, what are you currently working on? What projects are you currently working on? What's the future for Heather Raffle? <laughs> I have two, uh, two projects I'm working on. One is a filmed version of Nine Parts of Desire. Oh my goodness. Right, that we are really hoping is gonna happen in Michigan this summer. The filming is gonna happen. And I think what's, what's beautiful, the reason why I'll mention it, it's beautiful for a million reasons, but um, I've, I'm currently doing some rewriting to update, you know, some of the characters, particularly the American and pulling from that article from the American theater magazine article that this American character will have gone through the loss of a father during COVID mm -hmm. and how those losses relate to 
many of the losses Iraqis have been feeling throughout, you know, that Nine Parts of Desire was already written about. But um, we had lost the space that we were supposed to film it in. It's being supported by Detroit Public Theater and People's Light Theater in Pennsylvania, but we lost the actual physical space we were going to um, shoot it in, which wasn't the theater. Um, and it was so beautiful because I kind of um, put a call out to my dear friend, another actor, Matiko David, who's a Syrian Iraqi. Um, and he said, you know, we talked about the Assyrian church in Flint. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can shoot it there. Oh, wow. So oh, that's so meaningful. And there was this, like, I got goosebumps everywhere. And I said, you know, to shoot, to shoot this film in a sacred place as a prayer for my dad, as an offering, right? It just- And, and, just, and the community, right. The community, the community is sacred and that belongs to the community that it's representing. And I think the story is, if I have it straight, it's the oldest Aramaic speaking church in America. Oh, I think. Okay. Right. But anyway, like but it's old, so it's extra. If I've got some of those facts wrong. <laughs> That's still so like, just special. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can feel why like this is special. So I mean, nothing's all answered. Nothing's for sure. I just offer it. I wouldn't have even spoken about it except this community understands the important of it, importance of it. So I bring that up. And then the other thing I'm working on is a very, very big play about migration and the global economy. But what's beautiful about this play is it just takes place all over the world. It's all these scenes from all over the world. And we follow people and stories as they're moving. And we come, we keep coming and landing back in places like Michigan and Ohio. We land in these swing states, right? As this relationship to how we're seeing the movement of the planet and why people are on the move and some really rich there's one really rich Iraqi character in it that I, I love so much. So, so it's, um, it's really a play about understanding the local relationship to global issues. So wherever the play would go, there would be a local scene. There would be something about what's actually happening in that town that we then see in the context of a moving world. Well, two things. Um, I'm so glad that you're going to be shooting here because then I can reconnect with you because <laughs> the, the last time we reconnected was when you were here for Nora and, and we had a great time uh, when we met with other writers as well. Um, so that was great. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Plus, it does have such a meaningful angle for you to be shooting it here. I think that it would make a lot of the community very happy. Um, and then regarding your new play, do you have a title for that? It sounds very interesting. But the or working title. Mm -hmm. is tomorrow will be Sunday. And I can oh, tell you. <laughs> I love that. I Good. love that. I do. I don't know something about that. Tomorrow was will be, I was waiting for a word. It kind of caught me off guard, but it just felt so home. Yeah. And I can tell you the meaning behind that. So um, one of my cousins told me a story about his mother in Mosul um, that during the Farhud, when the Jews were leaving to go to Israel, Yes, she had gone as a Christian, her family had gone to the Jewish neighbor's house to buy things that they were selling before fleeing. And that her neighbor had said to her, you know, you can take what you want. Today is Saturday, but tomorrow will be Sunday. So the play's premise is that tomorrow is Sunday for all of us that the, the moment that we all might have to be on the move mm -hmm. is now. Like it's not, it's not so far in the future. And I mean, we all are aware or unaware of what's happening with the climate and what's happening with divisions across our nation and across the world. So it's really a call to action that Sunday's a lot closer than we, yeah. than we think. Yes, and, um, and I guess, you know, based on what you're, this response is like if, if there's something because um, one of the things I often I always bring this up because I, I still can't get over it but it's uh, you know when, when we watch movies I mean all the minority groups that feel that they're underrepresented and unheard actually have a space they they do have some kind of a platform in comparison to the Arab American community in, in comparison you know but 
I feel like our community has just really no space in, in the storytelling, not so much with the books, but then um, when we were watching like Netflix and other stre streaming um, platforms. And one thing I found out though, on top of it is that Netflix, they have uh, an Arabic selection, which is wonderful and has movies from all over the world that are somehow really, really good, but nothing from Iraq. I was so disappointed in that. I thought, wow, well, but then it's not also surprising because of all that Iraq has gone through, that country has gone through so much like horrendous experiences. It's like, there's no room for creativity when you're going through that. And like you said, that survival mode. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it's so important because we do feel underrepresented and unheard. So what advice would you give? Because you have that ability or being born here and understanding the depth of what the, that country has gone through and its people and being half Chaldean yourself. What advice would you give for storytellers who are trying to tell their stories, but maybe just feel like they're saying it to basically into a void? No, I mean, to, to piggyback on both things you said, I think there is tremendous potential and tremendous camaraderie amongst many minority communities in America, right? So I'll speak for the um, theater community, that the Middle Eastern theater community has learned a lot from the African American theater community and the Asian American theater community and the Asian American theater community, including Excellent. Arab Americans in their conferences. Excellent. And that, right, like these, these communities can't, it shouldn't be about who, which minority got a slot of the thing that was chosen for the, the, the you know what I mean? Like it's, it really is the, essential that the communities work together to uplift each other's voices. And I will say that at least in the theater, but perhaps through most of the arts, um, the Middle Eastern community is, isn't is younger in age, but it's younger and it's organizing. Yes, It hasn't been organizing together as long. It kind of came together as an org to organize in a post 9-11 world, which is really what, 20 years. So that's not it, it, and it's, it, it's also had, newer in the immigration process. I've looked at like the, compared to other communities who have come here longer. So that has a lot to do with it too. Yeah. So they have a they have a lot to learn, but it's really our camaraderie that is going to move us all forward. I agree. And I think we need to see each other as allies and and Americans too, Americans of all stripes as yeah. allies. Like it's really, yeah. it's really a, it's the potential is great. <laughs> And it and the time couldn't be better. So I think that's that's beautiful. That's exactly yes. It's just opening our hearts and our minds to what is what it is available rather than what's dividing us. Because look at that. Just this is an example. If we were to like focus on what's dividing us, it really prevents us from going forward. And we feel like we're not heard. We're not this. But the but the reality is, I mean, both of us write about the Iraqi American experience, right? And and both of us have gotten, um, we've been able to showcase our work in different ways. So there is a lot of room for this is just to do the work and to believe in what we're doing um, and to, you know, to, to collaborate with people who also have similar interests. Um, any last words, Heather? I can I talk to I'm, you for hours. I know, I know. When you come to Michigan, okay? I, know. I will. <laughs> I will. I can't wait to have a lunch or a dinner and just talk for hours. Yes. No, it's really just a pleasure to be in conversation with you and with our community. And I and I can't wait to share the film that we shoot in the church with the community. Yeah, like I, I think that would be really special. That will be so much fun. And and like I said, it's much needed in this community because it's uh, Michigan has the largest Arab concentration of Arab Americans and the largest um, Chaldeans in the whole world. Uh, you know, the, the Christian minorities are here, the Assyrians. And so this is going to be special for everybody. Thank you so much. And we will have a link uh, with this recording for your new book for people to be able to purchase it. Thank, Thank you, you, Heather. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.